Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Please excuse me for uh, the voice, which um, I do hope will improve. Uh, so far, the more I talk, the better it actually gets. Um, it's also, of course, uh, proof that uh, science may have many, achieved many things, but actually uh, a cure for something as simple as a cold is uh, still passing us by. So I'm going to start off with uh, this gentleman. David Tredenick, thankfully, is, is not typical of uh, the kind of MP uh, in the House of Commons and how they deal with scientific issues. But there is a wider issue, I think, with the uh, level of scientific expertise uh, in the House of Commons, and particularly, actually, with um, rather than the narrow technical expertise that people have, actually uh, a, a kind of broad affinity for what science actually is, how it works, and what it might have to, to offer for politics. Now, if we go forward here to actually just look a bit at science in Parliament, there are, as I'm sure you know, 650 MPs. Um, these figures I'm about to show you are all from a, a, a Hansard document. Um, there are 158 who have a, a background in business, um, 90 in professional politics, 86 from the law, and 38 uh, from the media. And um, how many scientists? Has anybody got a, an answer? There he is. <laughs> uh, Julian Huppert, who's a Lib Dem MP for Cambridge, is the only MP who has actually worked in a PhD uh, science level job. Now, I'm not saying for a second you have to be a trained scientist to actually get, understand science. I'm not one myself, I'm a history graduate. But, Actually, I think if you look at the sort of wider number of uh, MPs who sort of actively have a record of engaging with science like this, it's poor, actually, for the Times. We did some research on this uh, at the time of the last general election, and we came up with a figure of about 80 who really had shown any kind of record of really getting involved. So really put simply, there aren't enough geeks in politics. And I think this matters because it contributes to a kind of disconnect between science and politics that really does neither of them uh, very uh, much good. With so little affinity for science, so little knowledge of the scientific method, um, too many MPs also fail to realise uh, how science can actually contribute uh, to better policy. So if we look at the management of science first, a lack of kind of... Uh, institutional know-how as to, to actually how science operates leads to uh, unintended consequences uh, again and again. Um, if you start to cut or even to freeze uh, the funding of science, even in uh, austere times uh, as they are at the moment, uh, there's a grave danger that actually uh, you cut off the flow of the pipeline of talent. It's not actually a tap that you can turn on and off at will. If you cut now, you end up with a situation where there are fewer people who have been trained in their to PhD level now uh, who you might want later on. Uh, there's also, I think, a lack of uh, appreciation of the way that science uh, uh, leads to economic growth and, and particularly quite a narrow focus at the moment on uh, actually trying to show the uh, direct economic impact of policies rather than actually realising, as I think people who really uh, do understand science know, that it's actually by following your curiosity that you actually end up very often with the breakthroughs that have the biggest impact. You've also got policy errors like the immigration cap. Now, uh, anybody who'd worked in science or who had a broad knowledge and understanding of it uh, would be able to tell you straight away, science is an international game these days. It's also a game where, uh, particularly at junior levels, uh, people are not actually particularly well paid. So actually trying to introduce a cap on talented people coming into this country and discriminating on the basis of salary was always going to be uh, damaging. 
But that's not actually the only or even the most important uh, set of reasons why uh, this disconnect matters. And actually, it's um, a lack of appreciation for this. Carl Sagan, uh, I think, encapsulated really rather well what science is all about here when he said it's more than a body of knowledge, it's a way of thinking. And this approach to uh, acquiring knowledge, uh, the experimental approach, uh, the approach that's founded on evidence and data and seeking to test that evidence uh, so that, uh, uh, and, and revising positions in light of evidence, is something that I think, as an approach to knowledge, has been outstandingly successful and could contribute much more than it actually does to politics. You can see it also, this was the IF Yalayokal, the, uh, the, the Icelandic volcano that caused the ash crisis a few years ago. Now, obviously, that was a, uh, a natural disaster which um, science uh, couldn't, which, which politics were going to, was going to have to deal with uh, whatever happened. And actually, ministers were in the slightly unfortunate situation here of having to act with really very little evidence as to uh, what the effect on jet engines and so on actually was. But there was a reason why there was very little evidence, and that's that despite the warnings of geologists that this was an issue that uh, could and probably would happen in the reasonably near future, it was not included in the national risk assessment. Chief scientist was not properly consulted on that process, and therefore that evidence was never actually uh, gathered. When the evidence actually is there, when, when there's evidence out there, Politicians have a, a, a habit of actually abusing it in a number of different ways. And there's actually so many of them that you can, you can draw up something of a taxonomy. So there's evidence shopping, the idea that you, you have a policy, uh, for example, Jackie Smith deciding that cannabis should be class B rather than class C. Then instead of using the evidence to develop that policy, you shop around for evidence afterwards that happens to suit that policy. You've got imaginary evidence. A great example of this recently was um, uh, Andrew Lansley effectively uh, uh, making up some statistics about, or, or really badly misinterpreting some statistics about heart attack deaths uh, in uh, Britain and uh, France in order to justify uh, his NHS reforms. Um, you've got fixing the evidence, which is uh, uh, very often when there's evidence you don't like, you you try and sideline it or you get rid of a person who's telling you that message. A uh, good example would be uh, George Bush when uh, uh, Elizabeth Blackburn, future Nobel laureate, was uh, on his council for bioethics and criticizing his stem cell bo policy. Uh, they just got rid of her, sacked her. And just recently, actually, Theresa May, uh, in fact, removed the requirement for any scientist to actually sit on the advisory council on the misuse of drugs. Um, you've then got uh, clairvoyant <laughs> evidence, which actually I have to uh, blame Mark Stevenson over there for the term. Um, this is actually uh, commissioning research, knowing exactly what it's going to say beforehand. Uh, there was a great example when Patricia Hewitt was health secretary saying, uh, um, home births are safe, and we will commission some evidence that will show that <laughs> to guide our policy. Um, you then got mishandled evidence, where actually the evidence uh, showed something slightly different from what they said it would. And, and finally, there's secret evidence. This is evidence that really nobody can scrutinize because actually um, it's not published. Recent example, uh, Damien Green last week uh, in relation to the Heathrow uh, border agency crisis was saying it's not as bad as everybody says it is because of this unpublished data that I can see and you can't. So, that's um, where we are there. There's also the issue of experiments in politics. And this is Ralph Waldo Emerson. All life is an experiment. The more experiments you make, the better. Science has it a place when we know the answer already or when there's good advice to give. But it also has a really important place when actually we don't know the answer to a question at all. It's almost more important. Uh, but there's really very little appreciation in politics of how the stuff of science, randomized controlled trials, that sort of thing could actually contribute to issues such as education uh, and uh, a criminal justice policy. There's actually a disincentive to doing rigorous evaluation afterwards because, of course, it might well show that the policy didn't work and then you'd potentially be uh, uh, handing your opponents uh, a, a card. And this isn't party political. All sides do this uh, badly. 
And um, in, in many ways, what politicians think is, is sometimes less important than actually how they think. What's their approach to, to evidence and so on? Now, why does this happen and, and, and what can we do about it? As I said at the beginning, most politicians aren't anti-science like David Trudinick. He's a very extreme example. But there's a wider problem, as I think the uh, uh, composition of the Commons shows, uh, with indifference to science. Ignorance in the sense of just not knowing, the non-pejorative sense. I think one of the reasons why scientists, are, uh, why, why politics is so indifferent to science is actually um, science and evidence-based policy and all these things just aren't political issues. Uh, there's no political cost, really, uh, to getting this wrong. Uh, and, and therefore, MPs feel no real need to engage. And well, why isn't there any cost? And actually, it's because we let it happen. Those of us who actually care about this don't make it, by and large, a voting issue, a lobbying issue. Uh, we don't actually allow it to uh, be something that is central to the way that we actually hold politicians to account. Um, we don't lobby MPs. We don't stand for office. Uh, we don't create a political cost, and really, that has to change. Fortunately, I think it is starting to change. You all know this gentleman, I'm sure, uh, Simon Singh, and uh, his famous uh, words about the bogus therapies promoted by uh, chiropractors. This statement, obviously, as I'm sure you all know, led to Simon Singh being sued for libel. Fortunately, he won his case. I'm really pleased today that uh, just in the last hour or so, the government has brought forward a, a libel reform bill in the Queen's speech. So that is absolutely terrific news. But the reason why that actually got onto the agenda was that uh, Simon Singh got a huge amount of support from um, ordinary geeks, actually. The mainstream media was not really touching his story, uh, weighed in, really started to campaign, uh, really started to uh, uh, create a sort of groundswell of, of, of support for him that kept him going. He then had groups like Sense About Science actually sort of took this up and ran with it uh, to actually sort of channel it into some really effective political lobbying that got all three parties eventually uh, to commit to, uh, to libel reform. And that's something that I think we really need to do more of. And um, I think the Singh case, one thing it really showed is that there is this sort of upswing of um, kind of science in popular culture, scepticism. Uh, there are more visible geeks in popular culture than ever before. You've got uh, uh, Brian Cox's success on television, uh, Robin Ince uh, on, on the stage and the radio. You've, you've got the impact of blogging and Twitter and so on, which really allows uh, like-minded people to come together uh, and actually form a critical mass as, as never before. And there really is, I think, a bigger community of people who think this way uh, than is often assumed. I mean, the, the campaign for science and engineering, which incidentally I'd urge you all to join, um, estimate that there's about uh, 3 million people uh, in the UK who either have uh, a science degree or a kind of job that's in an industry that's uh, uh, linked to science. That's really quite a significant uh, number of people, and we need to mobilize that. This is Nicola Blackwood. Uh, she's uh, the Tory MP for Oxford Western Abingdon. And what she says here is really important, that actually the post bag, the emails, matter, not because they're going to necessarily change her mind or she's going to feel forced to agree with them, but because they force her to think about an issue that, sh that might otherwise never have come really properly to her attention. We need to do that more. We need to use the organizations that, 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 that work on this kind of thing. We can blog about this sort of thing. We can use the media. We can campaign. And we can join parties as well. Um, if we do have political views that are broadly in line with the main party, we ought to be getting involved. We ought to be uh, uh, starting to help select the candidates. I mean, it's incredible that actually candidates for MP are very often selected by a really small group of party activists, often as few as 100 or even fewer than that. There's a real chance to get involved and make a difference here. This is something that must change, uh, that can change, and ultimately it's up to those of us uh, who care about this to actually make it happen.